Uh, boy, isn't it interesting times that we are living in? Um, we're seeing it unfold right before our eyes. I mean, uh, watching the news, reading the newspaper, if anybody reads the newspaper anymore, it's just like reading the Bible. Uh, the lawlessness, uh, the wildfires. Have you seen the wildfires out west? Totally amazing. Wow. Uh, the hurricanes. Uh, we had two in the Gulf this year for the first time. Now we have five active named storms right now. First time since, I think, what they said, 1971. And then, of course, we know about the pandemic that's going on. Uh, peace treaty. Wow. Wow. Major, major peace treaty signed this week. Uh, somebody asked me, what does that mean? And I said, you know what? I don't exactly know what it means, but it's a precursor to something. And it very well might be uh, the same treaty that the Antichrist comes along and uses. Uh, obviously, everybody hasn't signed on yet, but there's more and more that are. And so, um, boy, you, you name it, it's happening. And so here we are. We're not just studying about Revelation. We're living it. How many would say amen? <laughs> well, like we said last week, um, the greatest and the most important revelation to come to the Apostle John while he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos was simply the revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, when I say simply, that's not uh, downplaying it by any means. But if we're not careful, uh, we as the end time church, uh, we need to be careful that we don't get caught up in all the hoopla of Revelation. Uh, does everybody know what I mean by hoopla? <laughs> uh, all the imagery, um, all the 300 symbols that are in the book. Uh, we, we've got to be careful that we don't get caught up in all these little minute details and descriptions and miss the obvious. Uh, if we see anything from the book of Revelation, we need to see Jesus. Jesus. Um, we need to see Jesus. Now, I, I love Bible prophecy. How many love studying Bible prophecy? I love Bible prophecy, always have. I love uh, hearing it, uh, I love teaching it, love studying it uh, about the end times. But we must be careful that we don't get out of balance. It's like anything else, grace, uh, faith, <laughs> uh, everything that's presented to us in the Word of God, uh, there must be a proper balance with it, right? The Bible says, here a little, there a little. Uh, like we've said many times, we just don't take one verse and take it out of context and build a denomination about it. Come on, somebody. Uh, but we've got to try it. We've got to uh, keep it in context. And so we've got to be careful uh, with these things that we see in the book of Revelation uh, because we don't want to get out of balance. We don't want to spend all of our time worrying about, well, who's the Antichrist? Who's the false prophet? And uh, when's this going to happen and when's that going to happen? Uh, in fact, let me say this. I think the devil would love for us to spend all of our time trying to figure out the what, when, why, and where's of the book of Revelation, all the details, all the symbols, all the storylines, all the timelines, and then miss what God is doing right now because how many know God is doing something right now? He's doing something. He's moving in His church and it's a great day. Uh, to be alive, and it's a great day to be in the kingdom. And so we've got to stay balanced. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to just spend all of our time in deep study and get caught up, and before you know it, that's all we've done all week is kept our nose in, in the book and then missed God-given opportunities uh, to do the work of the kingdom, to share our faith, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and so like we keep saying, I want us to be caref careful here of how in-depth we get uh, in this study, uh, most of all, uh, we want to be led by the Holy Spirit. How many would say amen? amen. And uh, that's exactly what John was 
while he was on the Isle of Patmos. Now, I want you to put yourself in John's sandals, if you will, okay? Here you are banned to the Isle of Patmos uh, for preaching the gospel, and instead of having a pity party, instead of being down in the dumps, right? No, John is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Can anybody say amen? John was full of the Spirit, he was led by the Spirit, and he was in the Spirit. Let's look at that as we start out here tonight. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 10. How many understand if we're going to get anything from God, if we're going to receive any impartations, any downloads, any revelations, then we've got to get in the Spirit. And the reason why I say that is because flesh cannot understand the things of God. The carnal man cannot receive the things of God. And so we must be full of the Holy Spirit. And as we are praying and fasting this month, I would really encourage you to pray in the Holy Ghost, to pray in the Spirit. Because how many understand, you cannot pray a wrong prayer in the Holy Ghost. Uh, If we're not careful, we'll pray some soulish prayers. If we're not careful, we'll pray some selfish prayers. Come on, somebody. But if we're praying in the Holy Ghost, then we're going to pray the will of God. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray the will of God into effect. But uh, here in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 10, it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was, here it is, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as a what? Trumpet. Trumpet. How many believes we got a trump today? I mean a trumpet. We got a trumpet in the White House. Anybody say amen? Oh, goodness. And so uh, here tonight, before we get into our scripture references, and uh, really, oh my goodness, there are about 101 different ways Uh, We could go with this. Uh, But before we get into some scripture references, I want us to look at our chapter uh, breakdown. And we're going to try to kind of simplify this for you. uh, Because I'm doing my best to keep it simple and not overwhelm us. Because uh, if you're like me, when you get overwhelmed, no matter how good the knowledge is, if you get overwhelmed, you get frustrated. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Your mind just, it, it can't absorb it and you go away feeling more confused than, than what you started. <laughs> and so we're going to try to be careful with this. And like I said, just continue to pray that the Holy Spirit leads us accordingly. But in chapter 1, verses number 1 through 18, we can see Jesus in all of His glory. We see Jesus in all of His glory. And this is unique, and this is different, because we're not used to seeing Jesus in this light. The Jesus that we see in the book of Revelation is not the same Jesus that we see throughout the New Testament, especially the Gospels. It is the same Jesus, but He's very different, okay? And so, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 18... We begin to see, we begin to have this revelation, John does, of Jesus in all of his glory. And it's just about more than John can contain, more than he can describe, and so on and so forth. And we'll come back here uh, in a minute and talk more about that. But then in chapter 1, verses 19 through chapter 3, we see Jesus among the seven churches. And uh, how many remember that we listed the seven churches last week? And if you'll recall, uh, those seven churches uh, that were named were actually churches in John's day. And so they were real churches there in Asia Minor. Uh, But in dealing with those churches, uh, Jesus gives us a, a brief history, if you will, of the church from the first century, until now, here today. And so what the breakdown of the seven churches is, is not just a historical element, 
but uh, we can draw something from all of those seven churches and we can apply them to the church of today. How many know we are the church of today? And how many understand we get to decide what kind of church we're going to be? Right? We, we can either be an on-fire church, we can be a church of brotherly love, we can be a, 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 a Laodiceo type church. We get to decide what kind of church we're going to be. So these seven churches just aren't historical, uh, but they uh, relate to us even here today as we are closing out the church age. And so uh, when we look at the seven different churches, uh, we can begin to see the correlation between them and the seven dispensations of time. How many remember the seven dispensations of time? Uh, I think we went over those uh, during the series on the blood moons. How many remember the blood moon series we did? It's probably been, what, a good five years ago because I think we were still over at the West Campus, so it's been a while. Uh, but we won't get into those details right now, but quickly, uh, the seven dispensations of time are, first of all, the age of innocence, the age of conscience, civil government, promise, the law, the age of grace in which we are now in, and then uh, the seventh is the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ known as the kingdom age. Now, with this kingdom age, we must be careful uh, because a lot of the promises uh, that we read in the Word of God are pertaining to the kingdom age which is yet to come. How many know the kingdom age is going to be an amazing time? It's going to be a time of peace. The Bible says that the, the lion is going to lay down with the lamb. So how many know we, we're going to have to have some major changes before we step over into that time? Obviously, there's going to be some huge changes that take, in, that take place. And so like we said in the message about the great falling away, uh, we have to be careful when we read particular verses and passages in the Bible that talk to talk about all this great, grandiorous, the, the earth is full of his glory type scriptures because a lot of times those are referring to the kingdom age and aren't meant to happen in this age of grace that we live in now. Can anybody say amen? Now, I'm not trying to pop anybody's balloon. I'm not trying to say that we don't believe God for revival, that we don't believe God for a great awakening, that we don't believe God for signs and wonders and revivals and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is we got to go with the Word. We got to stick with the Word. It's not what I want to happen. It's what God says is going to happen. Right? And, and like I've said so many times here lately, uh, even though we're praying and fasting, and I, and I hope you are, I hope you're joining with us, but, and I don't mean this to discourage us in, in any way, so just please hear me. We can pray, we can fast, we can decree, we can declare, we can bind, we can loosen, and we're supposed to be doing all those things as born-again spirit children of God. We're, we're supposed to be taking our rightful authority, but listen, we can do all of those things but there are still some things that are going to come to this earth that we cannot stop. We cannot stop. With all of our prayer, with all of our repentance, I don't care if we crawl on our knees from here to Washington, D.C. I don't care what we do as a church. There are some things that we are not going to stop happening. And uh, can we see a turnaround? Can we be by some time? I hope so. I pray so. How many's praying so? I'm praying that uh, we'll see a turnaround. We'll see some things happen. We'll see a, a abortion overturned. Come on, somebody. I'm believing we're going to see a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, souls to be saved. But ultimately, we know that there's some things that are just going to happen that we can't stop. We know eventually the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. We know eventually... Uh, the tribulation period is going to begin. We know that uh, the Antichrist will come to power. We know that in the middle of the tribulation, he will profess himself to be God, and uh, he will actually what? The Antichrist will actually what? Die. He'll die, but he'll be brought back to life. How many know that's a lying sign and wonders right there? That's why we've got to be so careful. 
And so we know these things. And then we know he's going to go into the temple and the Bible refers to it as the abomination of desolation. He's going to set himself up as God. And boy, I tell you what, this Jews, the eyes of the Jews are going to be uncovered, aren't they? And, 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 and that's so important to know because at the close of this age of grace, the Holy Ghost dispensation as we know it, it's the church age, but it's also known as the Gentile age. And what a Gentile is is simply this, somebody who's not a Jew. Now, I would say this. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you need to hurry up and get saved because the Gentile age is about to come to a close and God is about to turn his, hearts, his heart from the Gentiles and he's about to turn back to his people, the Jews. Right? And so that's what the tribulation is all about. And, uh, and while I'm saying that, let me say this. Oh, Lord Jesus, that's what I mean. You go down one trail and it leads to another. Uh, you know, you look at Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, and you see the disciples asking Jesus. Uh, he talks about the temple and, and, you know, the fact that it's going to be overturned. And, they're, and they say, well, when, when's the sign? When, when are these things going to happen? And da-da-da-da-da. And... Obviously, if you go through Matthew chapter 24 and you start to read chapter 24, uh, if you really know your Bible prophecy and you start to dissect some things, um, you can see where it might really appear like the church is going to go through the tribulation. Hello? I mean, it really does. You read that Matthew chapter 24, and if you don't believe me, go home and read it tonight. Read it again. And then you will really think, okay, maybe we are going through the tribulation. But on the other hand, and that's what I said, I say this tongue in cheek because I don't want to say Revelation is confusing, but it gets deep quick. Uh, because we could say this about Matthew ch chapter 24, and I know this is a little dicey when we start making remarks like this, but you could look at Matthew chapter 24 if you are a pre-tribber and you believe that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. And you could say, well, if you read Matthew chapter 24, it looks like we go through the tribulation. But what if Jesus isn't addressing the church in Matthew chapter 24? And what if he is only addressing the Jews? Because his disciples were... Jews. They are the ones who asked these hard questions in Matthew chapter 24. So for those who want to argue the fact that, hey, yeah, we're going through the tribulation because look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24. But what if he's not referring that to the church? And what if he's only referring that to the Jews? Boy, now that'll part some hairs real quick, won't it? And so that's what I'm saying. we got to be so careful about this book because if we're not careful, revelation will cause division in the church. you got your pre-tribbers, mid-tribbers, post-tribbers, and we all want to argue the fact. But listen, I'm not here to argue tonight. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I just want to go before the tribulation starts. Can anybody say amen? Woo! And if not, then we'll have to deal with it when it gets here. Can anybody say amen? And guess what? If we don't go up before the tribulation, then God will take us through the tribulation. I promise you, he's big enough to take us through that thing. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I said, man, you just you open up one thing and it just leads to another. It's just so amazing. And so we talk about the dispensations. We talk, we talk about the seven churches. We talk about uh, the, the, all these ages. And, and it, oh my goodness, it can just get so complicated. But as we talk about the dispensations, remember this. The definition of a dispensation is simply a system of order or government. It's a time of stewardship when God gives man things to be stewards over. It's a time of administration and it's a probationary period that has a distinct beginning and a distinct ending. Now that's important because that, mean, that means every age has a start date and it has an expiration date. 
How many understand that even though the church age has been going on for some 2,000 years now, it has an expiration date on it? And guess what? We're not going to go past that. Just like I said earlier, it doesn't matter how much we pray, fast, repent. Uh, God's got a timeline, and he's going to stick with that. And so, in the seven dispensations of time as we know them, each dispensation is unique and different. If we go back and, and study the dispensations of time, which I don't know if we'll do at this point, uh, we might come back and hit that later on, uh, we will find that God deals with man differently in each one. And how many know God just relates to us on our level? Right? But like we've already said, once we start getting revelation, once he starts downloading and imparting revelation to us, then to whom much is given, much is required, right? And so then, uh, if you look at the end of chapter 3 in Revelation, if you look at the end of chapter 3, and you take into account the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, we find ourselves at the end of the church age, which is the age of grace, and that's the dispensation that you and I are living in right now. So at the end of Revelation chapter 3, we find the end of the church age. And this is very ironic because if you look closely, we can find Jesus somewhere at the end of the church age. And guess where Jesus is at the end of the church age? It's found right here in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 20. As the church age concludes, look where Jesus is at. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. If anyone hears my voice, and remember what Jesus said earlier in this very same chapter. He that has a ear, let him hear. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Wow. Wow. At the end of the church age, we find Jesus on the outside looking in. That's scary. That's scary. He's knocking at the door saying, if you'll let me in, I'll come in and dine with you. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty scary to think that we'll have six dispensations of time and Jesus is still on the outside looking in. Especially the church age. After the cross. After an empty tomb. How many know if anybody gets it right, we need to get it right? The church age, amen? So, as the church age comes to a close, at the end of chapter 3, Jesus was on the outside trying to get in. And then, after chapter 3, we find no more mention of the church. No more mention after chapter 3. The church is not mentioned anymore. That's why I believe we're gone before all this stuff breaks out on planet Earth. And let me just say this, if, if you don't think it's going to be bad, read Revelation. Read the book of Revelation. I don't, know, I, I don't know anybody in their right mind would want to be here during the tribulation. Now again, I say, if the rapture does not happen, then I believe God miraculously, supernaturally provides for us and makes a way. But, I tell you what, if I have my choices, I'm going before. Anybody going with me? <laughs> and so after chapter 3, we find no mention of the church. And this is one of the reasons uh, why the pre-tribs believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, but we'll talk more about that later. And then we see in chapter 4, all the way to the end, chapter 22, we see Jesus on his throne. Okay, uh, I told you this is a revelation about Jesus. First of all, we see Jesus in all of his glory, and now we see Jesus on his throne. And how many know that's all we need to see? Look at your neighbor and tell him, just keep your eyes on Jesus. 
Don't matter who the false prophet is. Don't matter who the... <laughs> I've already heard. Is Trump the Antichrist? He signed the peace treaty. No, Trump's not the Antichrist. Oh, my goodness. But, but sometimes we'll worry about our, ourselves about all these things when we just need to keep our eyes on Jesus. What does the Bible say? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher... In other words, if he started it, he's big enough, he's good enough, he's faithful enough to start it. Can anybody say amen? So that's all we need to see is Jesus because all the other things in the book of Revelation are coincidental in relation to the fact that they will and must take place, but in all actuality, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Let me say that again. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And how many know who or what the main thing is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And so we can't go wrong if we keep our eyes on Jesus. We go back to Matthew chapter 24 again. Jesus talks about all this deception that's coming in the last days. Well, guess what? We won't be deceived if we stay in the book if we stay in prayer, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, right? right? In, in fact, he's, the Bible talks about the fact that he's coming back as a thief in the night. But how many know that's only for the ones who are not looking for him? The Bible says, those that are looking for him shall he uh, appear. 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 And that's going to be one of the differences that we'll talk about uh, between the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church. Because how many understand the rapture of the church is a signless event? It's shh, Jesus is coming. Shh. Remember the ten virgins? Five were wise, five were foolish. When they didn't expect it, the bridegroom came. Right? And so when, when we talk about all these signs, we talked about signs at the beginning of the service tonight, all these things that are happening, all the signs that we talk about, all the signs that are taking place are referring to the second coming of Christ. And the second coming is at the end of the tribulation when every eye will see him. Because at the rapture of the church, whether it happens before the tribulation or after the tribulation, the rapture of the church only happens for those who are ready and looking for him. That's, we're the only ones that will see him at that time. But when he comes back at the second army to defeat the devil in the battle of Armageddon and all the armies of this world, the whole world will see him. Okay? And so, oh my goodness, there's just so many things that we're going to have to go over in this study. Uh, but the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. Can anybody say amen? All right, Lord, help me, Jesus. I'm having a hard time staying focused tonight. Whoo, I got to keep my eyes on Jesus. <laughs> when, when we spend all of our time and energy uh, trying to figure out the who, what, when, why, and where, uh, you know, who's Mystery Babylon? Who's the great whore? Who's this? Who's that? Uh, when we spend all of our time trying to figure out all the 300 symbols and what they mean and the timelines and so on and so forth, uh, if we do these things as Christians, if we just sit here and argue back and forth uh, uh, what are different interpretations, uh, then we miss the very essence. We miss the very meaning of what John's revelation truly was. Because his revelation was so great. We talked about some of it, remember Sunday, in the message about heaven. And John saw heaven. And how many know heaven is a real place? And so, uh, you know, if we want to be excited about anything, let's be excited about heaven. Let's be excited about Jesus. Anybody say amen? Uh, because obviously, again, I say this, and I, I know I'm... I'm I'm hitting this home, but after this week, I'll, I'll move on to something else. The greatest revelation to come from John's revelation is Jesus himself. Wow. 
And uh, if we'll just keep our eyes on Jesus, all the other stuff will work itself out. Right? Won't it? And, it all, and guess what? We'll end up being okay. You know, one way or the other, God will bring us through. Amen? And so, uh, just Lord, just keep our eyes on you, Jesus. Look at your neighbor and remind them, God's got this. Uh, one thing I've noticed about God, he's got a way of working out all the little details. If I can just put my faith and trust in him, everything's going to be all right. How many understand God doesn't need our help? He only needs our obedience. Right? That's all. He doesn't need our help. He just needs our obedience. He just needs somebody to believe in him, to, to put their faith and trust in him. Amen? Uh, now, quickly, before we close this out here tonight, and I know this doesn't seem like much, but let's go back to chapter 1, and let's see how John describes Jesus here. And this is really important. Everybody say, this is really important. The reason why this is really important is because this is the very last picture that we get of Jesus in the entire Bible. Okay? This is the closing of the book. This is the last book of the Bible. And this is the very last picture, last description that we get of Jesus. And in doing so, I want you to notice how this portrays Jesus or how John sees Jesus. What this picture portrays Jesus as isn't the suffering servant. He's no longer Mary's little lamb. He's no longer at a whipping post. Come on, somebody. He's no longer hanging on the cross beard being plucked out, crown of thorns on his head, being spat upon. No, he's no longer in a borrowed tomb, but he is now not only the judge of all humanity, but he is the judge, jury, and executor. Can anybody say amen? He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords, and he is the judge of all judges. Ha, <laughs> ha, he is the judge, jury, and executor of all the forces of hell and of all those who came against him. Hmm. That's what I said. This is a Jesus that we've never seen before. This is a side of Jesus that we've never seen before. And so uh, this is how John describes our Lord here in chapter 1, verse number 13. Look at it with me. First of all, he is clothed with a garment down to his feet, which this flowing robe is a representation of his dignity and honor. Hello? How many know you, you hear no mention of swaddling clothes lying in a manger? <laughs> no. He's not Mary's little lamb this time. This time he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. You talking about a role reversal. My goodness, what a role reversal. Uh, and so this flowing robe is a representation of his dignity and his honor. He will be honored this time as King of kings and Lord of lords. Then secondly, in verse 14, his head and his hair are white like wool. Even Daniel calls him the ancient of days in Daniel chapter 7. How many know before there was anything, God was? <laughs> God was. Verse 14 then goes on to say that his eyes were a flame of fire. Woo! Could you imagine what it's like to look at, look at his eyes? They are a flame of fire in which nothing is hidden from his sight. He sees all and he knows all. Woo. Woo. And I know, I know what some of you are thinking now. Oh, that's scary. No. He sees all, he knows all, and he still loves all. Can anybody say amen? Amen. 
How many are thankful for the blood? How many are thankful for the grace and mercy? The only thing we got to get right is we got to get covered with the blood down here. We got to bow our knee now. We got to confess now, right? That Jesus Christ is Lord. And so his eyes were a flame of fire. Nothing is hidden from his sight because he exhibits an intelligence that brings hidden things to light. He sees all. He knows all. He hears all. Nothing is hidden from him. Then in verse number 15, his feet are likened unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. And this meaning is twofold. The metal symbolizes not only Christ's Humanity, his human side, because how many know he was all man, but yet he was all God? He was the God man. He was God incarnate. God wrapped himself in, in human flesh and became a man. What, is, uh, what does the word say? John, he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so this metal symbolizes not only his humanity, but his righteous judgment. Not only his ability to judge, but his right to judge. How many know a, a, a judge can only execute judgment in his jurisdiction? A judge from Ken, uh, Kentucky can't go out to Kansas and be a judge. You've got to stay within your jurisdiction. But how many understand God not, only, God not only has the ability to judge, but he has the right to judge. Amen? In verse 15, it goes on to say, His voice, oh my goodness, His voice as, is as the sound of many waters. Woo, can we just close our eyes tonight and imagine what Niagara Falls sounds like? Oh, wow. Maybe we can close our eyes and imagine what that hurricane sounded like down at the Gulf. Many waters, that's the voice of our God. His boisterous words reflect His power, His authority, and His majesty. We're talking about how John received the revelation of Jesus here in chapter 1. In verse 16, we see that He has seven stars in His right hand. And these seven stars not only represent the pastors of the seven churches, but the angels who are constantly around him to do his bidding. <laughs> Think about that. The God of the universe has all the resources of the universe at his disposal. At his disposal. That's why there's nothing that's too hard for our God. Woo, how many are thankful that what's impossible with man is possible with God. That's the kind of God who we serve tonight. Verse 16 goes on to say that out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword. How many know what that represents? The Word of God. And how many understand that it can have the same effect when it comes out of our mouth? Our mouth. Yeah, exactly. our mouth. Amen? <laughs> That's why we've got to learn the Word. We've got to speak the Word. The Word works when we learn to work the Word. Amen? Amen. And so out of his mouth went a, went a sharp two-edged sword. And this represents not only the Word of God as we know it, but it is a symbol of his righteous judgment as well. Remember what the book of Matthew says, For by your words you will be justified. See, there it is. Or by your words, you will be condemned. What does the Bible go on to say? Life and death are in what? Power of the tongue. Two-edged sword. It's powerful what we speak as human beings. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. But when we put the Word of God in here, and when we learn to speak what does say at the Lord, it becomes even more powerful. Two-edged sword. Everybody say a two-edged sword. You say, what, did, what, what does a two-edged sword mean? It means this. It cuts going in, and it heals going out. Hello? Cuts going in, and it heals going out. 
How many understand surgery doesn't do you a bit of good if the doctor doesn't put you back together at the end? How many know if you don't get stitched back up, you're going to bleed out? You're going to get infection? The Word of God goes in. It cuts us. But when it comes back out, and where does it come out at? It comes out of our mouth. When it goes in, it cuts us. It does surgery on us. But when it comes back out of our mouth, that two-edged sword, it heals us. Woo! How many are thankful for the Word tonight? <laughs> Anybody get anything so far tonight? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For by your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's all making sense now. Because if we are like Jesus, because remember, we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and the likeness of God. We are now sons of God, right? We're children of God. We're heirs of God. We're joint heirs with Christ Jesus. So if, if he has this rightful place and position and authority, guess what? We do too because he's not here anymore, but I don't have this down, guys, but real quick, and we got to close because I'm out of time. But it's 1 John. I just feel like we need to read this real quick. 1 John, I believe it's 4. I didn't have this down. Here it is, 4.17. 1 John 4.17 Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have what? Boldness, because the righteous are bold as a lion. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You say, how in the world do we have boldness in the day of judgment? Listen, the Bible says we come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. Now that doesn't mean arrogantly, it doesn't mean proud, but it means as a son, we come in confidently. Dad, I'm here in the name of Jesus. I'm here under the blood of the Lamb. I'm here because of your grace. <laughs> that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in the world to come, in heaven. So are we in this world. This world. That means if we don't have all power and authority, if we ain't raising the dead and casting out devils, it's not God's fault, it's, it's our fault. Because as He is, so are we in this world. And so, in this book of Revelation, we're going to see a side of Jesus that we've never seen before. Okay? He, he, he's not going to be Mary's little lamb anymore. He's not the little uh, cute little Jesus in the manger. You know, little baby Jesus in the manger, swaddling clothes? No. And then finally, in verse 16, we'll close this out. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. It says, And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Wow. Wow. Think about that. His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. In other words, his look. Oh my. His look, his appearance reveals his exalted, glorified status. He's no longer the meek and lowly Jesus being beat and whipped at the whipping post. He's no longer the meek Jesus standing before Pilate and not opening his mouth. Huh. But the roles have changed. Boy, has, have the roles changed. <laughs> My goodness. His look and his appearance reveals his exalted, glorified status. No longer baby Jesus in a manger. No longer the carpenter from Nazareth. No longer Mary and Joseph's son. But he has taken his rightful place as the king of glory, as the king of the universe, as the judge of all judges. And guess what? The judge is about to hold court. 
How many know this world and this devil out there has got a court date that they got to keep? How many know God has given them a summons? <laughs> he has given them an order to appear. And they got a court date. They got a court date before the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the judge of all judges. Let's read this in closing. I'm done. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And when, when John saw him, he fell at his feet as dead. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, <laughs> I am alive forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Woo, Jesus even amens himself. <laughs> he says amen. <laughs> and I have the keys of Hades, of death, of the grave. Write these things which you have seen, and these things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Woo! Can anybody say praise the Lord? <laughs> Again I say the greatest revelation of revelation is the revelation of Jesus in all of His glory in all of His majesty, in all of His beauty. <laughs> like we said Sunday, we're going to have to have our new bodies to be able to even look upon Him. Can anybody say praise the Lord? All right, all right. Let's quit for tonight. I know it just seems like we're getting started, but my goodness, there's so much to this. And so I'm not quite for sure exactly where we're going to go yet Wednesday, next Wednesday night. Uh, but wherever the Holy Spirit leads, amen. How many are going to be praying for us? All right, let's all stand together. Praise the Lord. Yes, Sister Sarah. Amen. Yeah. Yes, that is so true, Sister Sarah, because how many understand we don't live off of John's revelation? We've, we've got to know Jesus for ourselves. Amen. And aren't you thankful there's enough Jesus to go around? <laughs> Lord, we just thank you, Father, for this time. Lord, I thank you for all those who have come out here on Wednesday. Lord, what a great crowd on this Wednesday night Bible study. Lord, I just thank you that there's a hunger and thirst that is rising up among your people. Lord, there's a hunger and a thirst and a desire to know the truth. And Lord, we thank you for truth because, Lord, it's the truth that, that, that makes us free. And Lord, I just thank you, Father, for these amazing times in which we live. Lord, on one hand, it's, it's chaotic. Uh, it's perilous times. In fact, that's how your word describes it. But Lord, on the other hand, we look up with great hope knowing that our redemption draws nigh. But Lord, until you come, Lord, we must continue to occupy. Lord, we must be continue to be busy about our Father's business. So Lord, even this week, I pray, Father, that you would lead us and guide us according to your Holy Spirit. God, that you would give us divine favor. Lord, give us divine favor with God and favor with man. Lord, give us divine appointments with people, places, and things. Lord, put us in the right place at the right time. And, and Lord, hope, open our mouths that we may speak what thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Lord, that we can share our faith, that we can share our testimony to a lost and dying world. Father, we thank you, God, for the encouragement we feel tonight as we just read your word, God. And we, we, we think about all these sweet and precious promises that we have. And so, Lord, I just thank you and I praise you. Lord, I just pray for everyone that's here tonight. If you have a need, just reach up your hand by faith. 
Hallelujah. Father, I just lift up every need that is represented here tonight. Physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially. God, whatever it is, Father, you know. You know exactly, God, what the need is. And Lord, I'm just asking you to meet those needs according to your riches in glory. God, I'm just asking you to pour in your oil and wine. God, the kind that restores our soul. And Father, I ask you to encourage your body tonight. Encourage your church, Lord. Build us up in the most holy faith. God, may we go from this place with a spring in our step, knowing, God, that you are for us, knowing that you're working all things together for our good. And Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. Lord, for this upcoming service this weekend with our missionaries. And Lord, we just pray that if you tarry till then, that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit in a great and mighty way. But Lord, most of all, help us to be watching and help us to be waiting. Help us to be looking (laughs) for your appearing. And Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory in Jesus' name. Can anybody say amen? Amen. Amen.